Hi, it's Katrina. Number 9. The Index Librorum Prohibitorum The Catholic Church's history of censorship dates at least as far back as the 9th century. Still, one of its more extreme attempts to control its followers came with the publishing of the Index Librorum Prohibitorum in 1560. Established by Pope Paul IV, it was essentially a list of thousands of books and publications that Catholic worshippers were banned from reading. Perhaps the most dramatic form of censorship in Christendom, the Index was not limited to theology. It banned works ranging from love stories to philosophical treatises to political theory. The Index prohibited both religious and secular works, as well as versions of the Bible that the Church had not approved. Many were written by intellectuals and were about topics like astronomy and philosophy. The invention of the printing press had made reading material far more accessible than ever before, and Catholic authorities saw this type of thought-provoking and scholarly material as a threat to its followers' faith. Pope Paul IV created the Index partially as a response to this increased availability of literature, which officials believed might encourage people to question or stop believing what the Church told them. Twenty subsequent editions were issued over the next several hundred years, with the final version being published in 1948. It was only enforceable within the Papal States and in places where civil governments adopted it, which happened in several Italian states. The Catholic Church formally abolished the Index Librorum Prohibitorum in 1966. Instead of replacing it, officials left it up to each individual to discern what types of material are dangerous to their spiritual well-being. In announcing these changes, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith reminded followers that they have a responsibility to use sound moral judgment in making these decisions and avoiding anything that might poison their faith. Number 8. Poveglia In northern Italy's Venetian lagoon, less than a half mile from Venice, the tiny island of Poveglia first appeared on the historical record during the 5th century. It remained inhabited until 1379, when its residents fled because of warfare. Starting in 1776, Poveglia was used as a quarantine station for plague victims and sufferers of other diseases before being converted into a mental hospital in 1922. The island has been vacant since the asylum closed in 1968, despite recent efforts to repurpose it into a luxury vacation resort. As much as half of Poveglia's soil contains human remains left behind by the over 160,000 patients who died there. Archaeologists have uncovered mass graves containing the remains of hundreds of plague victims on nearby islands, but have yet to fully explore Poveglia. Legend holds that a doctor who worked at the island's mental hospital tortured and killed patients before butchering them. While these claims remain unsubstantiated, the hospital's remains are still there, being slowly reclaimed by nature. Meanwhile, many paranormal enthusiasts believe Poveglia is haunted. But the island remains off-limits to visitors, and there is no word on if or when it will open up to the public. Number 7. The Destruction of China's Past China's first emperor, Qin Shi Huang, began making power plays at the young age of 13, when he became the head of his state and had his mother's lover executed because he was a perceived threat to the young man's power. He ruled as the Qin Dynasty's first emperor from 221 to 210 BC, during which time he got rid of any material that scholars might use to challenge his supremacy. Acting on the advice of his chief advisor, Li Si, Qin Shi Huang is said to have ordered the destruction of nearly all previously existing books within the empire. The only exceptions were literary works on astrology, agriculture, medicine, divination, and the history of the Qin state. Anyone who was caught with certain ancient works, such as the Book of Songs or the Classic of History, faced brutal punishment. The year after the ban went into effect, Qin Shi Huang reportedly buried 460 scholars alive after they were caught with the forbidden books. Another account claims that the emperor had killed alchemists after they had fooled him into thinking they held the secret to eternal life. Either way, it's clear that Qin Shi Huang sought to destroy any historical records that failed to fall neatly in place with his narrative, and his mission succeeded leaving modern historians with gaps in their quest to understand the past. Number 6. Ovid's Banned Books The Roman poet Ovid lived from 43 BC to 17 or 18 AD during the reign of Augustus. He was extremely popular yet controversial during his time, 
often focusing on erotic themes that Augustus found inappropriate and felt that the public needed protection from. Without consulting the Roman Senate, the emperor banished Ovid to the island of Tomis on the Black Sea. Augustus took particular offense to Ars Amatoria, or The Art of Love, a three-book series that was meant as a guide to help men find and keep women, and to advise women on how to win and keep a man's love. Ovid's well-intending advice may have been interpreted by Augustus as a threat to the monogamous marital standards he encouraged among the population. His goal was to increase the Roman birth rate, but this was just the first of several times that Ovid's works would be banned from society. In 1497, during the burning of the vanities, followers of the Dominican priest Girolamo Savonarola collected and burned tens of thousands of supposedly immoral objects in Florence, Italy. Included among them were all of Ovid's works, which were also burned in England in the bishop's ban of 1599. The poet's writing was even banned from being imported into the United States in 1928, when customs officials prohibited an English translation of Ars Amatoria from entering the country. The ban was lifted two years later owing to a legal exception that allowed books of literary or scientific merit that were otherwise considered immoral to be allowed into the United States. Number 5. The Picatrix Originally written in Arabic during the 10th or 11th century, the Picatrix is the Latin name for a 400-page book about magic and astrology. Nobody knows who wrote it. Historian Ibn Khaldun attributed the book's authorship to an astronomer and mathematician named Maslama al-Majriti, but experts had since proven that this is unlikely based on passages in the Picatrix that are believed to date back to when al-Majriti was a young child. The book's origins have been traced to Moorish Spain, which encompassed the Muslim-ruled portion of the Iberian Peninsula when it was written. In 1256, King Alfonso X of Castile ordered the book to be translated into Latin, leading to its circulation throughout Europe from 1450 to 1600. As a result, the Picatrix had a profound influence on medieval and Renaissance magic, as well as philosophy and other scholarly disciplines. It was a controversial work, leading some who studied and praised it to avoid mentioning any parts of the book that seemed to run contrary to Christianity. But, as historian Avner ben Zaken pointed out, the Picatrix resonated with several Renaissance thinkers who were unfriendly to the establishment. And at some point, both the Arabic and Latin versions of it fell into obscurity until their rediscovery in the early 20th century. The Picatrix was essential for turning natural magic into philosophy, converting a sorcerer into an experimentalist, and altering the practice of natural magic into an official education system. It encouraged the application that scholars shift their focus from tradition and dogma to the distant sources of natural magic. Number 4. Taliban Totalitarianism Afghanistan was uniquely located along ancient trade routes, historically serving as a connection between the East and the West. Traders from many parts of the world passed through, turning it into a culturally diverse center of commerce. And in recent decades, a lot of this history was preserved. That all changed when the Taliban rose to power, causing archaeological excavations to grind to a halt, and ultimately leading to the destruction of tens of thousands of ancient sites and artifacts. When the Taliban reconquered Afghanistan, archaeologists and museum curators scrambled to secure the historical sites and artifacts that they still had access to. They were worried that the extremely conservative Islamic fundamentalist group would go around destroying valuable history, much as they had in 2001. During this earlier round of destruction, Taliban founder Mullah Omar ordered his militants to destroy a pair of monumental sculptures known as the Buddhas of Bamiyan. Standing at 180 feet and 125 feet tall, the statues were carved into a cliffside 8,200 feet above sea level during the 6th and 7th centuries. Under Omar's strict religious views, they were considered idols, and these are just two of many landmarks and artifacts that received the same label and have been lost to history at the Taliban's hands. The group also destroyed nearly 2,800 statues and other works of art at the Kabul Museum and some 55,000 literary works at the Pui Kumuri Public Library, which housed some of the nation's most historically valuable texts. Some suspected that Omar ordered the destruction as retaliation against Western countries for imposing economic sanctions on Afghanistan, 
and that the axe had less to do with his beliefs than he claimed. Either way, these ancient treasures from what was once a major cultural crossroads are gone forever. Number 3. William Tyndale's New Testament Along with the printing press came increased literacy in societies where reading and writing were once reserved for the more privileged classes. Now that commoners had ready access to printed materials, they began learning these skills in large numbers. This proved troubling for some religious institutions, which felt threatened by the possibility of people reading and interpreting the Bible on their own. After all, up to that point, many, if not most, worshippers simply trusted that what the church told them was true and that it was commanded by scripture. In England, it was illegal to translate the Bible into English or any other common language, and people were also forbidden from owning these illegal translations. Getting caught with one could come with the death penalty. William Tyndale was a forward-thinking biblical scholar who knew that the times were changing. He asked the Bishop of London to revoke the ban on English translations and to sponsor the publication of an English New Testament. The bishop refused, but Tyndale mass-produced the book in secret. Many copies were smuggled into England and other places where the translation was unwelcome, sending authorities after Tyndale. He was arrested in Antwerp in 1535 and was held prisoner at a castle in Belgium until late the following year, when he was strangled and burned at the stake for his decision to make the Bible available to everyone. Tyndale's New Testament remains one of history's most influential literary works, despite the extremes that were taken to try and squash it out of existence. It even coined several phrases that many people use regularly without realizing where they originated, including the powers that be, eat, drink, and be merry, and fight the good fight. Number 2. Nazi Book Burning As the Nazi Party rose to power, an association of German university students created blacklists of political and literary works that they deemed to be un-German. The lists included books by Albert Einstein, Ernest Hemingway, renowned poet and playwright Bertolt Brecht, novelist Eric Maria Remarque, and others who rank among history's most influential thinkers and creators. Many of them were Jewish. Starting on May 10, 1933, these student groups carried out a series of book burnings at universities throughout the country. In Berlin, Nazi propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels delivered a speech to a crowd of 40,000, proclaiming that Jewish intellectualism is dead. Thousands of books were lit ablaze at these gatherings while students marched in unity against the so-called un-German spirit. After the initial book burnings, the Nazis continued on their campaign to eliminate books by Jewish writers and others whom they viewed as a challenge to Hitler's extremist rhetoric from the public consciousness. The Germans burned millions of books in its occupied territories, including Poland, where 80% of the country's school libraries and three-quarters of its scientific libraries were destroyed. Number 1. The Great Library of Alexandria The burning of the Great Library at Alexandria in northern Egypt is one of history's best-known travesties. Founded in 283 BC, it was, at one point, the ancient world's largest library, housing over 100 full-time scholars and containing texts by renowned thinkers and writers like Homer, Plato, and Socrates. Even more impressively, it didn't admit visitors based on wealth, unlike other libraries of the time, but was open to anyone who proved to be a worthy scholar. Legend holds that the Great Library of Alexandria burned to the ground at some point, taking hundreds of thousands of valuable literary works with it but evidence suggests that its decline was much more gradual than experts previously believed, and budget shortfalls played a major role in the library's downfall. The first alleged fire at the Alexandria Library occurred around 40 AD, when Julius Caesar and his invading forces set it on fire, marking the first in a series of destructive battles and blazes over the following centuries. Government spending cuts and other policy changes helped immensely with tipping the Great Library at Alexandria into non-existence. When Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius revoked resident scholars' pay and banned foreign scholars from visiting, he effectively closed the library down, leaving its precious contents neglected and forgotten. Religious riots further damaged the Learning Center in 391 and 415 AD, and the library met its ultimate end in the year 640, when it was captured by Arab forces, who
who reportedly gathered the remaining manuscripts and used them as fuel for thousands of bathhouses. Thanks for watching! Remember to subscribe for more videos like these, and I'll see you next time! Bye!